So hey everyone, I'm Doug Renahan from the University of Victoria. I am a very tired PhD candidate because it's 6 a.m. here. Um, so I timed this to be exactly 12 minutes, but it might take 20 minutes because I'm gonna be pretty slow, but I'll try to keep it short. So I'm just gonna present on my recent work, which is in this title. This came out before the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got to talk about it at conferences. This is my first time. So I hope there's some nice uh, questions in the Slack for me. I'd love to answer them. Um, so first, I just want to start with this picture of M87. I know we all know what a brightest cluster galaxy is. And I just want to appreciate how beautiful they are, because that's why I study them. I think they're the most beautiful galaxies in the universe. Some people might like spirals. Those people might be wrong. But brightest cluster galaxies are the best cluster galaxies. Um, so, so just one point I want to make is that we know that the BCGs are unique galaxies um, compared to other massive ellipticals, right? They have brighter cores, they're much more extended in space and their evolution is tied to the cluster itself. So if we can understand how BCGs evolve, we should be able to understand how the clusters themselves are better evolving from the core um, to the outskirts. So, so I'll just go over the formation scenario for how we think the BCGs evolve over time. And the, the most dominant idea for this was through gradual hierarchical assembly. So this is where the smallest structures form first in the early universe. And over time, these gradually come together and merge and merge and merge until you get the most massive galaxies in the universe. So this, this plot is from De Lucia 2007, and this just shows the look back time from zero back to the Big Bang uh, for a single galaxy. And this is its merger tree. And you can see that at some time very far in the past, there were many, many galaxies. And these all come together to form something very massive. And most of the mass um, in this dominant idea of over like a decade ago uh, was coming in at late times and was through dry mergers rather than wet mergers where the gas would have come in and formed more stars that way. So, so if this idea was kind of solid for a while, what's, what's the real issue? Uh, the first issue is you heard about yesterday is this SPT2349 object, for me anyway. Um, so I urge you to go see Scott Chapman and Riley Hill's talks on YouTube to hear more about that system and probably have updated stats about it because when they came to me, there were only 14 massive galaxies all within 130 kiloparsecs, physical kiloparsecs at redshift 4.3. So I took this uh, plot on the left from Miller et al. 2018, which is the discovery paper. Um, so this is very interesting. There's 14 massive galaxies all within 130 kiloparsecs that must come together very fast and combine all of its stellar mass. Even if it doesn't keep forming stars, it should just make a massive galaxy very rapidly just based on its density alone. So that's interesting because that's really early growth and it's kind of like monolithic collapse rather than the hierarchical assembly route that everyone was thinking about. The, the second problem is this nice result from Collins 2009 and these red dots are five observed BCGs in stellar mass at high redshift above one compared to estimations of um, galaxy formation models of what the stellar masses of BCG should be at that redshift. And you can see that result shows that the BCGs are a factor of a few bigger than the simulations predicted at that redshift. So we have massive BCGs and observations at high redshift. And we now have these protocluster observations that have very high stellar masses and star formation rates at high redshift. So, so really, these should be the progenitors of some of the BCGs, at least, we think. And they should have an early growth route rather than the late time growth that was um, coming out in the 2000s. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to ask the question, how fast do these protoclusters become BCGs? And what are the properties of those BCGs? So can we do it in an isolated simulation first to have control over it to see what comes out? So I did that by taking the cold gas masses from Miller et al. 2018 and using the abundance matching results from Beruzzi 2013 to produce an isolated simulation, many realizations of an isolated simulation of this SPT2349 protocluster. Um, and that's shown on the right as a 2D histogram in stars of one of the realizations of that system. So before I go on, I just want to show you a video of this. I think Scott showed my better video of this yesterday, but I will just show you the 2D stellar histogram again. Uh, this is just in physical space. So after the initial conditions, this system rapidly collapses into something that looks like a massive elliptical galaxy. Definitely after 500 million years, 
it looks exactly like you would expect a BCG to look. It has a very bright core and extended stellar envelope. And it is very massive, definitely over five times 10 to the 11 solar masses uh, within a giga year. So if we start at redshift 4.3, about a giga year later is something like redshift three, let's say. So it's already a massive elliptical by redshift of three. So what did this look like quantitatively? Uh, on the right, I'm showing the stellar mass of the BCG as a function of time in our isolated simulation. And this is a very busy plot, I'm sorry, but the different line styles show different gas fractions we assumed for each galaxy because all we had was the, the gas mass. So we had to assume gas fractions, stellar masses and dark matter halo masses for each of the systems. Uh, the purple curve shows a five kiloparsec aperture. The coral curve shows a 15 kiloparsec aperture. And the black curve shows the total mass. So our fiducial simulation was the 0.7 um, gas fraction. That was our original assumption, but now we know that it's actually closer to 0.5 because they've actually measured this now. So in that case, this mass of the stellar mass of the BCG starts almost at 10 to the 12 already, rapidly grows up to 10 to the 12 by 200 million years. And it's already more massive than most of the clash BCGs, um, which you can find in those references. So we found a peak star formation of 3,000 solar masses per year. I think I actually found one that was higher at 6,000 solar masses per year in these isolated simulations, which is very high um, for an isolated simulation. Uh, so we asked the question, could we find these objects in uh, cosmological volumes? And I'm sure that Ray Sylvia talked about this this morning. Unfortunately, I wasn't awake. So I couldn't see that. So I'll have to watch it on YouTube later this afternoon for me. Um, and we, we, were, we were able to find it in the multi-dark Planck Bolshoi simulation, which is just a dark matter only simulation, a very large volume. And we looked specifically for halos, which had substructure that was very close to its own mass, all within a certain small region. So in this plot on the right, I'm actually showing you um, in the triangles, these are the substructure in the multi-dark Planck II simulation that are surrounding this X, which is a massive halo about 10 to the 12 solar masses. And I've overlaid the SPT 2349 circle, observed circle or boundary to show you that you really can find these objects in the simulation at this high of redshift. And based on some simple calculations, this should collapse within about a giga year, assuming they were all on circular orbits. So maybe the even faster in some cases. So, so we wanted to go even bigger and ask another question. What is, um, what's the probability of finding these events for a given final cluster mass? And by final, I mean at rate of zero. So I looked through every single merger tree in multi-dark Planck two of all clusters above five times 10 to the 14 solar masses. I looked back in their history and I said, when is the first time one of these events occurs? So we have some conditions like uh, you know, we need a certain number of objects coming together within a snapshot time step, which is the smallest time step we have uh, at high redshift, and they have to be of a certain mass of their host. So every time this happened, the first time it happened, I put a one in this plot on the left. So this is redshift. This is a 2D histogram of redshift and final cluster mass. Each one of these bins tells you the, the fraction of, in a single strip of final cluster mass, the fraction or the probability of getting one of these overdense collapse events at that redshift for the first time. So if that's confusing, you can ask me later about it because I've tried to explain this many times and I fail, I feel like every time. But, but what it tells you, if you reduce it even further, this is the high redshift fraction or probability uh, versus final cluster mass uh, per each final cluster mass bin. This tells you that uh, if you increase your final cluster mass, you're much more likely to have one of these higher overdense collapse events at high redshift, above a redshift of three. So this goes as m cubed. So if you're twice as big at redshift zero, you are eight times more likely to have had one of these overdense collapse events uh, above a redshift of three. So that's really like a cluster scale downsizing, right? Um, it's kind of like proto-cluster scale downsizing or any kind of downsizing where the core of the cluster is really undergoing its evolution first and then it will work its way out to the outskirts, depending on your mass. So the more massive clusters are forming their cores early, and these BCGs in the most massive clusters at redshift zero are much more likely to have formed above a redshift of three. But it's still only around, you know, just around 10%, maybe 20% of all the objects we could find. So this could explain 
stuff like the results from Sparks, where that showed this increasing star formation rate, even though it's probably not increasing because of the sensitivity, but there's at least thousands of solar masses in BCGs at higher redshift. Thanks. It's perfect. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> um, at a thousand solar masses at high redshift. Um, it could explain that, right? Because if you have these uh, massive clusters that are forming their BCGs very, very early in the universe, they have tons of gas to keep these star formation rates high, whereas later they will slow down uh, because they're running out of gas and can only grow via dry mergers. So, so that was the work that I did uh, before the pandemic, and that's published and on, uh, on the archive and in monthly notices if you want to take a look and ask any questions. But moving forward, we wanted to investigate this in zoom in simulations, because I'm very interested in BCG formation and evolution. So we decided to do that using the Simba model from Dave et al. 2019. This uses the mess free finite mass method, which seems to have the benefits of SPH, uh, while also the benefits of grid codes together. So that's kind of nice. Right now, we have uh, simulations at a resolution of 3 times 10 to the 6 solar masses per gas particle for 500 parsecs. And we re-simulated one of the 300 project clusters, the second most massive clusters, BCG evolution down to redshift 2. On the right, you can see a projection of the density for that. And this is, again, the same region that SPT2349 would have covered, about 65 kiloparsec radius. Uh, this galaxy you know, has 2,000 solar masses per year. It's very massive in stellar mass already at redshift 4.2. And there are 14 supermassive black holes in this region, all summing together to be 4 times 10 to the 8 solar masses. So we wanted to look at questions like, what is the thermodynamic evolution of this system? So from redshift 4.3, which is the SPT2349 observation, to redshift 2.5, you can see that there is a big difference in temperature. So this is, again, just a projection, uh, but this time temperature. And from the dark to the brighter colors, that's all of the hot gas. And you can see there's a lot more hot gas in that 1.5 giga years that happens. So we want to look at x-ray properties, how the ICM is built up, what causes the ICM to build up? Like, is it the AGN, is it the stars? Um, so these are all questions we're looking at. So right now I'll just leave you with my conclusions. 